in the room with all of you. Uh, looks like a wonderful gathering. Uh, my name is Matt Markman. Uh, I label myself as an anticipatory governance designer and socio-technical engineer, uh, where I focus on both uh, designing governance systems for the future uh, and responsive agile governance systems, uh, as well as uh, bringing together uh, social and technological systems uh, to produce particular ends and outcomes. Uh, I entered into the DAO space four, four years ago about, uh, and uh, when I came into the space, I noticed a uh, lacking of social science, political orientations, uh, in the Web3 space, uh, people were coming at the problem of governance and community management and organization and ultimately any of the ends we've been trying to achieve with this new technology uh, from the perspective of finance, from the perspective of technology, uh, from the perspective of community, however, not from the perspective so much of, of uh, traditional governance methodologies and sciences. Uh, so I uh, fell very quickly into the DAO worlds. Uh, where I worked at uh, founding the DAO facilitation team for Decentraland. Uh, and I co-created uh, and launched Big Green DAO uh, with Kimball Musk, uh, where we brought together over 100 uh, boots on the ground, nonprofit organizations in the food justice and security sector, uh, organized them into a DAO and uh, you know, launched one of the first uh, impact philanthropic DAOs in the world. Uh, that's when I first came across Othello, which I am now the CEO of. Uh, and Othello is, is uh, we're a digital democracy and community engagement uh, platform. We've been operating in the governance space for over a decade uh, and powered by a very complex multi-attribute decision-making algorithm. Um, you know, okay. we've worked with, yeah. Precise that you also um, uh, work you know, with a non-blockchain, you know, non-blockchain uh, project, like with the government of Canada. Yeah, yeah. So this is where, so so Othello is, uh, works with over 400 organizations, uh, including 250 local governance and municipalities in Canada. Uh, so they've been operating the digital democracy and decision-making space for, for 10 years. Uh, and we've been working together now uh, to bridge between the traditional governance, uh, municipal governance world, uh, and the blockchain world. Uh, so the focus of Othello 2 is uh, in participatory budgeting. Uh, we've allocated over $10 billion using Othello processes uh, and $150 million in grant making. Uh, and, you know, so what we've been doing is uh, becoming involved more and more with the DAOs and community management engagement and in the cities and using DAO technology as well as our traditional technology for engaging stakeholders in budgeting processes, decision-making processes, uh, official community plans, uh, and um, things like that for the municipal space. Okay, so um, can you, you know, maybe, tell the crowd um, if, if your approach, I mean, how you approach, what is Etelo, uh, you know, technology and what it brings to a, a DAO, maybe in some kind of example, um, in terms of governance, why, you know, what is the difference between voting one vote or one coin, stacking a, a coin to vote, or what else do you bring with Etelo to, to be able to, uh, you know, have proper governance. What are the advantage and inconvenience of what is going on usually in this space? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we bring to from Othello is a first, partially a way to sort of modulate the governance systems, uh, creating different types of voting for different types of votes. Uh, one of the problems with our standard political systems is we have you know, a vertically integrated voting system where we vote through the same methodology for every different type of vote, uh, for every decision. Uh, with Othello, what we've done is we've created different types of voting for different types of decisions. So we're able to create single choice votes for certain governance decisions uh, on policy, on operating structures, uh, and we are able to program 
customized voting for fund distribution, uh, for example, through quadratic voting uh, or through ranked choice voting. Uh, and this way that we can create the systems for governance based on the decision that we need. Uh, and it creates more agile structures uh, for the voting processes. Uh, with Othello, we don't personally use any side sort of staking voting. Uh, so some projects that we're working on are moving in that direction. Uh, for example, we're working with an organization to launch a stakeholder owned business uh, through a cooperative structure. Uh, and we're going to have multiple tokens within that organization. So one is going to be a community membership and utility token, which will be used for staking. Uh, and for staking there, we can use that for, uh, you know, creating buy into the ecosystem uh, and for uh, paying for services. Uh, but we're not using that for voting. Uh, we'll be using an ERC-721 NFT token for the governance side of it, uh, which will be, you know, for one of the interesting things about that is you can create different layers of that token uh, and give each token different powers. So you can have different stakeholders in the community organized with tokens that have different governance powers. Uh, so you can pre-program in voting power. You can pre-program in voting methodologies. Uh, so you can create a system where the right people have the right power at the it, for the right decisions. Okay, can, can we uh, dig? I mean, dig a little bit more about that, and maybe you know, speak a bit slower because uh, most of the people here are not in. I mean, are all bilingual, but not always. Uh, um, we are mostly French. Right? Uh, um, can, can you know? Can you, you know, in this example, for um, can you go more in details and and explain what if you know stacking is good or not a good thing? Because then, if someone has all the tokens, they can control the decision. Um, how do you? How does this type of governance help for more democracy or more equity in the decision process? And also. The, does it address the idea of taking complex decisions with different parameters? Yes, thanks. And I'm uh, here in Honolulu drinking my coffee. You're drinking beer, relaxing more. So uh, um, I'll, I'll try to slow down. Uh, I think you raise a very good question. And the one thing DAO technology does not do, or one of the many, is create culture. And when it comes to voting power in a DAO, I think the first important factor to understand is we don't exist in a vacuum, and we're moving through a process of progressive decentralization in most cases. So that means that power starts off within the hands of, of a smaller amount of people and over time expands out towards decentralized systems. Uh, so the way that this happens in many DAOs is through spreading of the token to token holders. Uh, and staking in particular, I don't think necessarily has an impact on, you know, where voting power is held versus, you know, if it's democratized. Uh, DAOs with staking can have, you know, what we call the influence of whales, just as much as DAOs without staking. Uh, what staking achieves for a DAO is long-term stakeholder buy-in. Staking is a mechanism that can help ensure the DAO has extended liquidity uh, and that stakeholders who are part of the DAO are demonstrating their commitment by locking up their value in the DAO. Uh, so it's an incentive structure uh, that can, you know, create additional value based on, you know, using our, you know, decentralized finance techniques. Uh, but it, in, in inherently in any DAO, with or without staking, you know, the issue of over-concentrated voting power uh, is something that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, why I started with a question of culture is if the DAO community is committed to 
decentralization, you know, these different type of voting modalities, such as quadratic voting or, you know, customized voting strategies are ways that we can offset the influence of, you know, high worth or high invested uh, individuals or organizations in a DAO system. Okay, so um, merci, uh, uh, Matt. I was, I have, you know, questions, but now I would like to you also to try to ask Matt, you know, what kind of, what would you like to learn to understand better about this topic? But I was thinking about Eric, who is part of our cohort uh, and his project, um, because what we found is that actually. We can think about governance when we have DAOs, uh, when we are thinking about managing common goods or for a non-profit, but we can also think about DAO and governance when we have users or clients that are, going, that are actually participating into a more commercial business uh, um, environment. And it has some similarities. Um, either yeah. Don't know with. Is it something um, Eric or Andres you're interested with? <laughs> it's important to understand what if Telu is doing uh, more precisely. What is the uh, yeah? What is the asset of the Telu to 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 yeah to to understand more. How this DAO is very is uh, leverage such to its technology. I mean, first we would like to very well understand. Maybe. <laughs> and that's the first question, perhaps. So, so, we, yeah. so you want to understand better how? So can you speak louder, please? Because I don't know. have to. No, we we have an overview of its position, its platform before entering into our question. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. What is value proposition on the market? So what? Absolutely. It's not yeah. taken granted that we know everything, but despite uh, all the, the rewards of God, <laughs> absolutely, the mission here do not know what is the Exactly. Yeah. No, it's better to, to be next to the microphone. Uh, Hi, so aloha. So loud. Uh, aloha. So um, I understand what he's saying, but I also I come from the DAO world. I was wondering um, if you want to talk a little bit more about Big Green DAO, because I'm actually a member of Big Green DAO, and um, I really, really admire how Kimball's run that. I mean, and the whole, you know, steward community and stuff. So maybe... Okay, um, so maybe you can explain, because you are in the room, what Big Green DAO is to the people here? Well, but he he did yeah. he architected the yeah. I'm not sure people understand. Oh, sure. No, it's about it. Yeah. Okay. So, well, big I didn't mean to take the stage. But, um. So, big green Dow is um actually uh so Elon's brother Kimball um is the founder of Square Roots. So he's been in urban gardening and urban agriculture for a long time. So during the pandemic. He said, um, look, we know that there's a lot of people, like a lot of teachers, who need micro loans um, to do their urban gardening, to do um, projects with their school kids, things like that. But they realize, as philanthropy, that it's really, really difficult to give away money. It's, it's usually time consuming. So Kimball, being in the position that he's in, got a bunch of his friends together, and they raised, actually, I don't know how much um, not that you may correct me, but they, they raised a, a number of a million dollars, let's say let's say ten million dollars. And then they then they worked out this doubt, and I'd really love to know more about exactly you know how how they how they came to architect it because it works very it functions very, very well. Um so they they worked out a system whereby they um teach it's mostly teachers and nonprofit or it's all nonprofit organizations um to apply to get micro grants. And most of the micro grants are used for urban urban gardening and urban farming for students and, and community gardens uh, and a lot of work with kids. Um, and so the great thing that I really love about being figuring out is that once you've been granted a grant, once you've qualified by by it's 
decided by the community. Um, then you then become part of the DAO. And then for the next granting session, you are also a reviewer and a decision maker for who the next grantees are. And in that way, they've grown very, very organically. And there hasn't been this pump and dump, <laughs> which is, you know, um, it's, it's just been very organic, very gradual, and, and very, very strong, too. It's a very strong DAO. Uh, and I know that they don't use tokens. They only use an NFT for, for membership. But again, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, no. That's very helpful. Thank you. I mean, does, does it? I mean, yeah. I probably have one question. Um, you were mentioning that uh, the DAO in particular is one. It's loud, loud, loud. So the microphone is here. It's used for the uh, cities, if I understand something related to. Is correct? I mean, you, you have to speak to, to them. <laughs> to, yeah. so, to hear me. <laughs> so, my question is uh, Have you been in contact with the Canadian Urban Institute in a way that uh, Canadian uh, municipalities can improve? Or leverage the, the way they capture investments, private investments, into the Canadian cities. And the second question: uh, In Canada, we have the business improvement areas, at least in Toronto, which is um, every district in Toronto uh, has, uh, rather than have an association, we have a BEI uh, business improvement area, which is a public-private partnerships for neighborhoods. So I'm wondering if uh, at the Canadian Urban Institute or at the municipal level, people directly can make investments into the assets. Uh, there's no secret that in Canada, there's more need for investments on infrastructure and to reduce the impact on carbon footprint on the municipality side, there is a way. So I'm wondering if uh, Canada is moving in, in, in towards this uh, target for 2023. I've been living in Toronto for a while. So um, I'm curious to, to hear from you, what is the, the, the match or the feedback that you got from Ottawa uh, related to the centralized uh, cities? Yeah, and I think maybe the request is to come closer to the computer for, for questions so I can get the whole sense of it. Were you asking specifically about Canada as a whole or did I hear you mention Ottawa in particular or was that not? Municipalities. So, uh, I, I, I don't tell. Uh, so, I'm just stating municipalities in a way that uh, the, the country works as a federal organization, and uh, each city basically needs to compete for budget to the federal government. So, I'm wondering if a DAO is going to help in some way to improve asset management. So Canada is quite strong on asset management. There's a uh, reduce on corruption. There's a country has high standards on that. So what is your vision about the DAO? And what is the, the way that we have, rather than both directly the taxes that we pay, uh, we can have a maybe alternative model, no, not a total new model, but something alternative. And I, yeah, that's the Canadian Urban Institute, because it's the, is basically the, the model that leads the, the structure for municipalities. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, one of the key parts of this question has to do with uh, creating new markets and marketplaces. Uh, and so you can do this with or without DAOs. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the things uh, that is possible using a DAO and using this technology is to decentralize the funding of municipal projects uh, and to you know create ways that uh, either centralized exchanges. Uh, there's a there's a company called Acumona that we work with as a fellow, uh, and they're a registered exchange with the Securities Commission in the U.S. Uh, and what they've done is they've created a mechanism to sell bonds that individual non-accredited investors can invest into and the funds raised from those bonds then go to a decentralized marketplace where cities can access it for funding uh, so they can go with specific projects uh, to these decentralized marketplaces to access funding for projects uh, so and i think there's also ways you know i think the best pathway through into 
the municipal space is leveraging existing support or what level of support there is for participatory budgeting, which is sort of the old traditional practice of involving uh, citizens in allocating funds that are you know, predetermined for a particular cause uh, and to evolve from there into the, the more marketized and DAO-based uh, integration of populations into the direct funding of projects or allocation of funds. I would say that the uh, use of blockchain technology widespread at the urban level is still limited. Uh, and you know where we're finding some support for it is in you know you know organizing community uh, and data, uh, but there's still a lot of hesitancy, uh, especially when you're talking about marketization and funding due to the speculative nature of the marketplace. Uh, there's there's still hes hesitancy from established actors, uh, but I do think that there is significant potential and some movements that are definitely growing in that direction for. Um, easing access to funds uh, and creating funding from more sources uh, for the municipalities. So, did you understand something? <laughs> no, you, you, we were talking about it, um, uh, Adrian, we were talking about it last week, right? Yeah. And you had some interesting comments. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, and, 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 and. Yeah, uh, just you mentioned the quadratic voting with NFTs with different levels. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could give us an example with like uh, how you handle the balance with number of votes and uh, a good use case that you had, because I think it's a very interesting concept, but I would like to understand really practically how it works and uh, what is good practice according to you? Thank you. Yeah, I think quadratic voting has two purposes. You know, one is to balance influence with democracy, you know, so we can spread power out and create more representative voting. Uh, and the other is it's a unique way to measure both the, the breadth so the the total amount of support as well as the intensity of support uh so in traditional quadratic voting models uh, if you want to allocate more votes to a specific organization it costs you more to do uh for big green dow for example we implemented a quadratic informed voting system uh which didn't penalize you for increasing the intensity of your vote for a single organization. But what it did was it it compelled you to vote using the quadratic modality. So you could offer, you know, one, three, nine, 16 votes to an organization. So it, 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 it incentivized you to either vote intensely for less organizations or less intensely for more organizations, spreading your votes out. So we were able to create a system using this, which both accounted for, you know, a democratic vote, you know, how many people support which organizations, as well as, you know, the intensity of that vote, you know, how strongly, how intensely do you avoid, do you support an organization? So through that measure, we're able to create sort of a mixed methods uh, voting system. That isn't just a first past the post single choice. It isn't just a rank choice. It's one that really accounts for both, you know, interests and intensities of voting. Uh, and we found that through using that, you know, we were able to distribute more money to more organizations uh, and, and spread out our grant making. Uh, so it was a interesting use case uh, of using quadratic voting in a traditional sense. Uh, in a traditional space. Uh, organizations like Gitcoin use quadratic voting for matching funding. So they have a pool of matching funds and then people make a donation and based on the size of that donation, a match comes in with a quadratic funding formula. Uh, so the more people that vote for an organization will get much higher matching 
uh, even if they're donating less money. So if one person donates $100 versus 100 people donating $1, uh, the, the organization that had 100 people donating $1 will get significantly more matching funds than the other organization. Uh, so that's another use case uh, specifically with matching funding or if organizations have a, a, a gifting pool, uh, that's a place to use it. But can we, I mean, for, uh, I mean, do you, do you have this question? I mean, is it something that in general, the question of using the technology to, you know, create more democracy and to be able to also um, address the fact that a decision is yes, is right, roughly yes or no. You know, for me, uh, the biggest shock I had about what voting means in politics was for the Brexit, you know, um, when the, um, and that's why when I started to hear about the different way you can address complex decisions, uh, I'm convinced that technology can, you know, raise our uh, political system. Is it something you, you've been thinking of? Or any, Say that. any comment? Yes, please. I have, I have one I have one comment which is uh, in any traditional business we see that the, the main stakeholders is the one that decides and when it comes to public good it's the only time where people voice count for one whatever resource they have um, so yeah of course people voted for brexit so it happened. <laughs> Uh, people, and, and so uh, actually not. I'm going to interrupt you yeah. on that because there was um, academic research from I think a hundred years before saying that actually when you have the post the answer between two answers, but actually people want a third one, it's the one that is the most negative that win in terms of uh, there's there's a, a BS that is supposed to be known that I learned at this time that actually when you have to vote for this or this, but actually you are thinking of that, you know, it creates a BS that can be anticipated. So that's what I mean about complex decision and the fact that using some technology that can, you know, address different layers and an outcome out of that is interesting. Okay. Yeah. I understand, I understand. Um, my, my question slash remark for Matt would be, uh, I'm, I'm the CEO of a, a non-profit organization named XRPL Commons. And so we fund uh, sort of public good, but it's not totally public. It's still in the business environment. And so how do you how do you get inspiration from uh, funding public good like a government a government does uh, and, and apply it to a, a more business environment? And maybe from to to be specific from a governance perspective and not from a technical perspective. Yeah, are you talking about within the organizations itself or within the marketplace? What okay. where are you looking? In the ecosystem, within a community or an ecosystem where you have stakeholders of various types. You have people who are building. You have people who are investing. You have people who are teaching. Uh, and people were just participating with, with goodwill, but not actually doing something. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we found with Othello in our 10 years of operation is that budgets and decisions that go through a community engagement process have significantly higher stakeholder buy-in than those that don't, even if the decision would be the same. Uh, so involvement in the process itself uh, increases uh, support for decisions. Involvement in budgeting and participatory budgeting has been shown to increase managerial performance, increase trust and commitment to organizations, increase willingness to engage with governments and corporations. So I think what this, what technology and governance structures can do is really kind of help create buy-in, you know, turn consumers and communities into stakeholders. And it's not so much always about actual decision-making power, but it's about the right type of engagement so that voices are heard and voices are involved in the process. 
so I think that, you know, governance wise, it's finding the right places to decentralize power. Uh, Cause I think that there's still an understanding that, you know, centralized decision-making is necessary uh, in, in, in business environments in particular, also in community contexts. So it's where and when we decentralize and what decisions we involve other stakeholders with for input and what decisions we involve other stakeholders with for actual, you know, power decisions that are binding and implementable. Uh, and I think what, you know, this governance structures with the technology can do is we can design these flexible systems within corporations, or within communities that create a agile structure, you know, that engage community for centralized decisions and also give community a slice of power, uh, give stakeholders a slice of power to allocate funds, to allocate decisions towards certain areas. Uh, so we can really kind of create more compartmentalization uh, and multiple parts working together and working on the right issues uh, separately. Thank you. Merci. Aurélien, yes, but please, to make sure you... Thank you, Matt, I have a question. Uh, you have various... Um, no, come, come, come. So you have various customers. Can you tell us about uh, one use case? Uh, one customer is coming to you for a specific need. What are the different steps you go through with him? And what do you do? Uh, what do you co-create with the customer? Uh, is it technical? Is it business? Is it ideation, recommendation about uh, the voting system? And uh, who is doing what at the end through the process of uh, co-creation of this uh, solution? Can you can you give us one example of one specific customer and and uh, the steps and the output? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Big Green DAO is is a very, you know, a, a very good example uh, of, of you know a traditional five hundred one c three nonprofit organization who saw a shift happening in their operations and a need to transform how they operate, uh, how they how they engage with community, uh, and you know the way the process works is. You know, we engaged in a series of strategic consultations, uh, you know, that was largely myself and Kimball. Uh, and, you know, he articulated his vision for what his organization wanted to do in the future. Uh, and we then co-designed a governance structure that represented that system uh, and put that together into a strategic document. So uh, a white paper. Uh, and then brought on a series of developers to, you know, program that system into different tokens uh, and uh, uh, different structures. And then we launched the DAP and we onboarded a initial committee of stakeholders to be the stewards of that organization. So we brought on five organizations, five individuals to serve as sort of a steering committee, what we call a, a DAO committee, uh, and then progressively decentralized and expanded the community, uh, bringing on additional community members into the community, giving them tokens, giving them voting power, and allowing them to engage in the governance process itself, you know, in what we call co-design. Uh, so we, we created a system that was not fully developed which I think is something that's pretty important when it comes to designing DAO technology, uh, is not creating the technology 100% ahead of time, uh, but allowing the community and the stakeholders who come on board to play a role in determining what the governance structure will be uh, and creating a technology structure that fits the social context and the network you're designing it around. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, it's growing into a sort of a software as a service system uh, because not all organizations want to be involved in managing the technologies themselves. Uh, so in the future, we'll probably see uh, some subscription-like models. Uh, but I, I do believe that there is no DAO in the box or plug-and-play DAO solution, uh, that these should be really developed through consultative processes involving executives, uh, stakeholders in the organization, stakeholders in the community, uh, and technical engineers and you know governance specialists uh, to create the system that is really best fitting for each specific context 
uh, and then making sure that the technology fits that. So uh, I think the first point is really understanding your community, understanding your objectives, what outputs and outcomes you want to see, and then positioning that against what technology you have available uh, and bringing them together to create a specific system. Maybe as a conclusion, uh, unless you have some other question, but maybe as a conclusion, you can, you know, like have share this uh, a brief overview of where Etelo is going, the fact that you're going to have the structure in Canada and the other one in the US, uh, if you think it's relevant. Uh, so Yeah, so, so as an organization, uh, you know, we've operated in Canada for 12 years. Uh, we've operated as a B corporation and largely sort of a social impact enterprise. Uh, and we're now transitioning to try to provide our technology at scale. Uh, and integrate more broadly within corporations and governments across North America uh, and Europe. And we are transitioning into a, you know, reincorporating in the United States, uh, bringing together uh, different players that we've engaged with over the years in technologies and uh, launching our uh, you know, our DAO based or participatory budgeting platform in the United States. Uh, so we're uh, looking to really transform the way that organizations engage with their community by centering financial decision making, uh, by creating engagements for people to involve themselves in budgeting and participatory budgeting and building community sentiment analysis, discussion, uh, and engagement mechanisms around that process. Uh, so uh, the next stage of our development is uh, reforming in the US and we're, you know, we're doing a, a raise for that starting this month uh, and also looking for core partners to integrate with and embed this decision-making technology with, you know, for existing softwares, or you know, organizations, networks that are looking to apply uh, digital decision making, digital budgeting, and blockchain technology to you know structure their networks around their operations. Uh, so that's the next stage of our development for us, uh, and uh, you know we're excited to be parts of conversations like this. And I, I would love to, if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, if anyone from this room just wants to have a one on one conversation. After this, you can get my information and I'm happy to do a, a free consultation on any sort of um, you know, governance design or opportunities of how blockchain technology or this traditional participatory budgeting technology can, can fit into your organizations. And uh, you know, just to learn more about the work that everyone's doing here would be very interesting since I can't join the room and, and hear about all the wonderful projects I'm so far away. Um, so. Thank you for the, the space to connect. That's super kind of you. Jacques André, do, do you want to? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Matt. And uh, I will probably uh, contact you uh, later for the uh, writing of the uh, blockchain and the sustainable development codes uh, reports uh, for the next one in 2024. Uh, thank you for your time and your uh, accurate insights. And uh, yeah. Uh, so we will continue to talk about it uh, during the drinks. <laughs> exactly. I have I have maybe uh, one final question if we have time for, for that. We've we've managed to talk about governance uh, and 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 everything without mentioning once the word blockchain. Uh, so if I may ask a technical one te technical question, what are the chains you integrate with today, and do you have any plans to to grow with other chains? You exposed my secret. Uh, the key is to talk about the technology without talking about the technology. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I mean, we, we are primarily on Ethereum. Uh, we work uh, also on Polygon. Uh, we are integrating uh, right now with Arbitrum. Uh, we're running, a, we're a grants program manager for Arbitrum DAO. Uh, and so we're running an end-to-end -end grant making solution for them using our technology. Uh, we're also uh, doing a community poll sentiment analysis for them. So we're integrating there. 
we're looking at integrations with uh, internet computer uh, as well. Uh, we are uh, also looking at, at integrations with Zero Blockchain, uh, which is Wilder World, uh, and they have a DAO platform. And one of the things we're most exciting about too is we just got accepted into a InfoSys incubation program. And so we're getting a team of developers and a project manager to support our open sourcing. Uh, so we're going to be open sourcing our software and opening our APIs, which will allow integration further. So the idea is to be able to embed and integrate into both Web 2 and Web 3 networks, regardless of their chain. Uh, and so uh, but right now it's focused primarily on EVM compatible. So, um, you know, the Ethereum network. So would that would that be able, I mean, would you be able to work with XRP Ledger? Yeah, yeah, we we we'll, we're, we'll be able to integrate. You know, we as we're basically our login systems uh, are able to create single source logins from other chains. Uh, and so, because I mean, what we're doing too is is integrating a traditional Web two platform into Web three. So we're using you know web hooks and other forms to create the the logins uh, from the Othello platform into the blockchain. So that makes us very agile in terms of what we can integrate to. Because uh, we just have to change the 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 entry point as opposed to integrate fully into the chain. But deeper integrations take longer time. When we start talking about integrating other DApps and um, things like we're integrating ThriveCoin's reputation, Gitcoin Passport. So as you get into the sort of more modular applications on other chains, it's it's still possible, but you know other development is needed. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, the last one. Uh... I was looking at your website and, and uh, you mentioned um, Gitcoin and uh, Kimadao. Uh, what kind of integration do you do with them? At the end, uh, do the members are voting on their DAO uh, with their token? Uh, like if you were not uh, working with this organization or at the end, after this collaboration, they integrate with some of your technology and it changed something at the end for the members that after your collaboration, it's a new way of voting. Uh, but I mean... Uh, I'm just trying to understand the use case uh, with, a, with a blockchain uh, driven uh, example. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I... Okay. Sorry, do you, want, do you want me to answer or no? No, I'll let you answer, of course. I mean, I I think the the most long term integration that we have right now is with Decentraland DAO, where we're integrating as a community pulse mechanism. So we're creating a persistent feedback loop for monitoring community perceptions and, and opinions within the DAO, uh, and making it so it's something that is is persistent and people can come and engage from the DAO. And then you can see support for DAO operations. You can have continued conversations. For Gitcoin, we were integrating on a project by project basis, uh, doing vetting within the organization for grants. Uh, the longest term integration that we'll have is what we're working on right now with Arbitrum DAO, where we're building the community sentiment analysis infrastructure, uh, as well as the end to end, end, end grant making solution. Uh, so uh, that's also for a big green DAO. So we run the big green DAO's entire governance system. Uh, effectively, you know, from the voting and snapshot all the way to the grants rounds uh, and their fund allocation uh, mechanisms. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> Enjoy. Bye. 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 Bye.